Looking for a guaranteed way to create content that resonates with your audience? Start a podcast, interview your ideal clients, and let them choose the topic of the interview. Because if your ideal clients care about the topic, there's a good chance the rest of your audience will care about it too. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey with Sweetfish Media. Guys, I've got with me today, Tiffin Dano Kwan, who is Chief Marketing Officer at SAP Ariba and SAP Field Glass. Tiffin, how are you doing today? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no, thank you for coming. I'm excited. It looks like we're going to be talking about the role of intelligent spend in B2B CSR campaigns, which is, uh, as I mentioned to you offline, not something I've covered Uh, so far on the show myself. So I'm always excited to bring uh, new ideas to our listeners. But before we get into all of that, I'd love it if you would just give us a little bit of background on yourself and what you and the folks at Ariba Networks have been up to these days. Absolutely. You know, I've been with uh, with SAP Ariba for almost four years now, but I am also an SAP employee. I've been working with SAP for almost 13 years now in different parts of the world. So I come from a a small country um, in Europe called France and a little village on the west coast of France. And I had a chance to to travel around the world, live in different places, experience really the the beautiful uh, landscape. And and, and I did this uh, for SAP for many, many years. And I've been living uh, in the U.S. for the past eight years. Uh, with the privilege of, of working in the procurement space, which is rapidly growing and expanding. And I look forward to the conversation today. Right. So let's get into it, man. The first, just based on what you said, the little bit of background that, that I know about what you do, just a brief little overview of how important uh, sustainability and, and human rights initiatives are to SAP and Ariba customers. <laughs> Well, you know, what we believe at SAP, but also at SAP Ariba and SAP Field Glass, is that our mandate, which is basically a span management mandate, extends far beyond what we look at the typical KPIs, efficiency and cost. Mm-hmm. Our mandate is much more global than that. And if you look at what we do, our core competency, we serve procurement professionals, supply chain professionals, finance professionals, HR professionals. And what we're trying to really uh, position to those professionals is that their impact can be absolutely connected to CSR goals. Supporting diversity and corporate responsibility priorities should be a mandate for any company right now. Proactively reducing environmental impact while meeting corporate sustainability goals should absolutely be top of mind. And last protecting the corporate brands and the reputation against unethical behaviors. One of them that we are really looking after is the supplier behaviors. De-risking our our supply chains as well is something that is really top of mind for us. And we do it through the power of intelligent spend management. Right. So allowing your customers to make spending decisions that influence their CSR efforts. um, That's exactly right. Yeah, connecting the two goals together and and what those professionals, whether they are IT professionals, HR, CFOs, or procurement professionals look at uh, first would be um, the the basics, KPIs, bottom line KPIs, efficiently efficiently running a business at a more cost, in a more cost effective way. 
what we're arguing is that a lot of companies right now are going way beyond in their own company-wide mandates. Of course, uh, all the lines of businesses in a company have to really look after the bottom line, but it's not enough. We have to take a broader view, a bigger picture view, and, and put some KPIs that are absolutely connected with those CSR priorities. Thanks. I think you just did a really good job of laying out the why and the what. So I'd like to get to the how. How can companies manage spend to deliver more effective CSR? And like, just talk a little bit about what all goes into intelligent spend. That's a great, that's a great question. So, so first, what goes into intelligent spend? We look at all categories of spend, whether it's goods and services, whether it's external workforce, contingent workforce, and travel and expenses. When, when you look at the total amount of spend that, that you have that runs in a company, it's pretty substantial. In fact, if you look at the aggregated amount of annual uh, value of spending around the world, it's in trillions. It's in trillions of dollars. And, and our Ariba network has an ability to capture, I would say, more than 10% of the total annual value transacted annually around the world. Uh, it's nearly $3 trillion transacting around the Ariba network. And that gives, um, I would say, the enormous that gives you an enormous uh, view of the potential here, potential for greater responsibility, potential for greater accountability. So, so that was um, the, the, the first point I wanted to get. But, but look also at what happens in us delivering the solutions, goods, services, external contention workforce, travel and expenses. We have great solutions that work really to deliver all of these to any company. And we have an ability when we dig into very specific solutions that support the exchange of goods and services between buyers and suppliers to really help them cater for those specific goals. So one of them, for example, is we're really looking at helping uh, companies create sustainable communities. So the requirements could be part of any kind of sourcing process than a company can have. In fact, the impact, if you think about the, um, the, the amount of people living in poverty, 2.2 billion people today live with less than $2 per day. If we start in the way we source goods and services, if we start putting really a sustainability mandate here, we can tap into a global community of environmentally sustainable suppliers. We can really also enforce purpose-driven policies that are consistently uh, making it easy for employees to buy from approved and ethical suppliers. And the goal here is to lift people out of poverty by really driving those practices, you know, sustainably and ethically. So these are, are really important. The, the other way we do it is we develop diverse global supply chains. Mm -hmm. So any company... Uh, who has diversity goals can actually use the power of intelligence, spend and procurement solutions to really uh, support those goals. So what we do is we drive policy compliance through easy sourcing process to discover, for example, equitable and diverse suppliers. But we also help companies achieve full visibility through spend analysis with very comprehensive information on supplier diversity and sustainability status. So you can go, you can really dive into the solutions and you start seeing clear information inside the product that informs you on how diverse your suppliers are and, and whether you're meeting your business goals or not. Right, so this is for people who, and it sounds to me, or for, for anyone at all, who understands how difficult it is to sort of confront things like whether or not, you know, the way you do business supports, you know, forced labor and things like that. Exactly. How difficult a step that is to take and, and facilitate. Because for a lot of folks, I would imagine, you know, it isn't that they, they don't necessarily care. They just don't know what's the simple way. So this, this idea of helping companies make this positive impact on society just by engaging in the normal course of business is huge. It's Correct. huge. It's, it's, it's so, so impressive. Um, but I want to make sure I get to 
uh, to everything that, that I, I wanted to ask you about. Talk a little bit about this concept of uh, three trillion reasons uh, and the role that that plays in B2B marketing. Absolutely. And, and I tapped into it a little bit uh, already. But, but basically, the way our business runs is that we have a community of uh, buyers and suppliers who interact on a network. Mm-hmm. We have millions of them interacting. And what they do all day long is they transact on the network. And if you look at the total value of the amount of um, money transacted in spend, the amount of spend transacted through that network annually, mm-hmm. it's about $3 trillion. And that represents more than 10% of the total um, annual value of transacted goods and services around the world. So that's very, very significant. So imagine how you can really look at the power of insights and data that are derived from that community. When that community starts to spend so much, mm-hmm. you have to ask yourself, how do you want the world to spend more ethically, more sustainably, more responsibly, with greater impact on the environment, with uh, a more diverse outlook around the world? It is totally in our power to do it. And that is the premise of, um, of this three trillion reasons to help the world spend better so that it can run better. Yeah. I mean, listen, you, you've got to, you've had to have come face to face with, you know, folks that just stop at when they ask the question, how do you want the world to spend? You know, I, I imagine you encounter the answer that it's just more right. <laughs> and, and full stop, not necessarily making it to the, you know, more ethically, more sustainably yeah. the way that, that you guys are facilitating. It's in, it's incredible. And I, I, I read that, you know, at the, at the heart of what you guys do or, or one facet of what you guys do is a, a, That's right. helping businesses choose to be able to partner with minority owned and women owned businesses to support uh, diversity around the world. Talk a little bit more about how that came about and, and what types of things you've seen uh, come out of that. I think it's about developing consciousness. It really is. So, so we do a lot of uh, work. We have annual events. We run sustainability summits. We run diversity and inclusion forums. We also develop very specific standards and insights within our solutions. And, and we have also very specific solutions designed to, um, to manage supplier risk, designed to identify diversity within our solution. So we're very intentional about it, but it's also about evolving the mindsets. You can't build a solution unless people are ready to really use that solution. So you have to explain to them the value. Why? Always start with why. Why is it so important? And, and I think what makes it perhaps easy or easy, more easy for us right now is open the news. Click on uh, your app and, and look at the, um, the, the news, what the government policies are putting all around the world. They're trying to reduce plastic. They're trying to really drive more ethical uh, ways of doing business. They're trying to really push more diversity, more women-owned uh, initiatives. It's a movement, right? So we are sure. really surfing on that movement. We're capturing the hearts and minds of our audiences and and we're bringing a, a lot of big topics. It's not just going into the technology for the sake of technology. We have right. to start with a bigger picture so that it makes the choice of the technology more relevant and obvious. Right. And you're, sh- and you're again, you're showing them how it does not have to be a chore. It does not have to be sort of an offshoot of what you, what your main way of doing business is. It can be your main way of doing business. And exactly. you know, it, just, it, it just requires, you know, first of all, having that tough conversation with yourself about what it is that you're doing, what the impact is, and, and then seeking out other folk, like-minded folks who, who want to make uh, the kind of impact yeah. that you guys are trying to make. And, and, and I want to also say that customers reward businesses who do good. Mm. So doing good is good business. We know it. We have the facts for us. 53% of millennials are willing to pay more for brands with more visibility into purchasing practices, number one. Number two, 80% of consumers in emerging markets will pay a premium from industries that are actively working to reduce their environmental footprints. And then 52% of consumers prefer buying from companies that are open and transparent in their operations. So those three facts they're very clear for us. And we have so many more. 
But just looking at the facts of and surveying, I would say, our audience or consumers tell us where we need to go next. So we're very confident about it. And we think that the, the, the premium, the added value that we have is that we go back home and we all feel good about what we're doing. Great. I love it. I'm so glad that you came on to talk to us about this. I think it's, like I said, such an important thing for folks who listen to this show and folks in the B2B space in general to start you know, or continue thinking about and, and going beyond that thinking and actually taking action. I, I thought about this the other day. I, I live in Austin, Texas. And uh, speaking of movements, there are several movements like that here in Austin. We were some of the first folks to ban plastic bags. Uh, and we recently, you know, have gotten rid of straws. And I, did, I, I was used to the whole paper straw thing, but you, you mentioned mm-hmm. paying a premium. So just a quick little story. I go to this, I go to this uh, bar and I order a drink. A lady gives me a drink. There's no straw. And I asked her for a straw and she says, well, we don't do even the paper straws. You've got to pay $2 for one of the metal straws, which you get to keep it and you can, you know, reuse it and take it wherever yeah. restaurants. And, you know, there's, there's one of two ways you can take that. You can whine about it and, yeah. you know, it'd be and, annoyed or you can, or you can, which I did, you can pay a premium. And that's an example, I think, of customers rewarding. I will go back to that place with my mm-hmm. metal straw you know, because of, yes, the way I was treated, but because I, like you said, they're putting their, they're doing good and, and being vocal about it. Yeah. But you know, you know, what, one thing that, um, I always, um, notice is that the end goal is so that people do it when nobody's watching. Think about Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. How long is it going to take for us to build practices, new, better, good practices that are sustainable, that are more diverse, we will have truly achieved real transformation when people will do it without even thinking about it. It will become sure. second nature that nobody uses is, uh, uh, plastics that are not recycled plastics, that uh, nobody uses straws anymore, all, all those kind of things. But it takes time to build those new habits. So that's the reason why having such movement is important. We need to raise awareness. We need to build new habits so that one day people will do it even when nobody's watching. I tell you what, so much good stuff, Tiffin. My favorite takeaway is doing good is good business. Uh, so now that uh, now that I've successfully picked your brain and seen what I could get out of it, this is the part of the show uh, where you tell me what you put in it. So uh, talk about a learning resource that you've engaged with recently uh, that's maybe informed your approach or that's just got you excited these days. It could be anything that got it me can, excited. It could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Okay. I might, might be cliche, but I love to read about inspiring people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name uh, Michelle Obama's biography as being really the book that I have, uh, you know, when I, when I go to sleep and um, listening, or not listening, but reading uh, her journey and what an inspirational leader she is, is just truly an inspiration for me. So it is right up in the alley of the topic of diversity. And I yes. think that we need to continue to have powerful, impactful, and kind role models. And, and she's one that completely inspires me these days. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And it's not so cliche on this show. I've only had one other person uh, give me that answer. And it was, it was a guy and it was delightful when he gave me that answer. I, I will never get sick of hearing people say that they love that book because I love it too. <laughs> so one last thing, I know folks who are listening are, are going to want to follow along with what you guys are doing and, and maybe figure out how to implement some of the strategies and things you talked about today for their own business. How can people uh, connect with you, Tiffin? Ariba.com. That's the one thing. I'd say come and hang out with us. Uh, you're welcome to come and visit us in our offices, the Palo Alto offices, the headquarters, but we also have great events around the world. It's called Ariba Live. We actually have our next event in Tokyo next week. It's completely sold out. And then uh, later on uh, in um, August, we're going to be in Singapore. Then in September, we'll be in Sydney and later on in Dubai. So we have lots of stuff to show a lot of good to share, and we look forward to seeing you there. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Tiff. And we'll have to have you on the show sometime again in the future to talk about uh, all the things you guys are doing here around the world. That that Ariba Live sounds sounds exciting to me. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thanks. You have a good one. Hey guys, if you've been listening to B2B Growth for a while, you know we're good friends with Sangram over at Terminus. So we wanted to let you know something really cool he's up to lately. This week and this week only, Sangram's newest book 
ABM is B2B is available for just $1.99. That's right, $1.99, a steal from the regular $14.95 price. And here are a few reasons why you wanna check out this book. One, you'll learn stories from six companies and the specific steps they took to take their ABM program from good to great. You'll also learn the team framework that Sangram talks about and is time-tested in over 100 companies. If that's not enough, they're giving away 100% of the profits and $10 per review of the book to the New Story charity. So check out the link in the show notes to take advantage of this screaming deal and get your copy of ABM Is B2B by Sangram Vajray and Eric Spett on Amazon for just $1.99 this week.